Last summer when I was training for the, for the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon, Robert said, you know, you should think about this a little bit, maybe give a talk to the residents about what you've learned and what you experience and what it's like. And I thought today I'll do three things. Number one, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Iron Man is. And then I'm often asked, are you really crazy? You know, what really prompts you to do something like this eight times? And then I'm going to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned over the last 25 years participating in triathlons. And uh, so, first of all, the story behind the Hawaiian Ironman. In 1977, there was an awards banquet in Honolulu. And attending the banquet were the members of the Mid-Pacific Runners Club, the Waikiki Swim Club, and the Around Oahu Bicyclists, a race that was done annually on the, on the uh, island of Oahu. And as happens at these awards banquets, there was a spirited argument about who was the fittest the runner, the biker, or the swimmer. John Collins, a Navy commander who had participated in some small triathlons in Mission Bay and also in Coronado in California in the early 70s, suggested, look, why don't we have a race, do all three, and whoever is the fittest will call him an Ironman. So sure enough, in 1978, 15 individuals entered the water in Waikiki, 12 finished, and uh, Norman Holler, a uh, communication specialist from the Navy, won in 11 hours and 56 minutes. The next year, without any publicity, 50 people entered. In the following year, uh, it started to get a little bit of traction. And then in 1982, it was moved to the big island of, Awa of Hawaii, and uh, in the Bay of Kona, Kona, Hawaii. And since then, it's become the world championship for triathlons uh, from around the world. And uh, there are 1,700 participants from 130 countries. And you must qualify by winning a race in your age group or getting in uh, the 100 lottery slots that are allotted each year. And as you can see, it's a 2.4 mile swim out and back into the ocean, 112 mile bike. And as you can see in the middle of the bike, uh, there's a volcano that one must climb, uh, which is really a challenge because of the winds. Uh, but fortunately, you come down the other side and you make up the speed you lose. And then a marathon on the Queen K Highway that literally goes out into the lava fields and 26.2 uh, mile run. And uh, so this past year, uh, Heinz Ward uh, was a competitor with me. And I have to say, I think I motivated him quite a bit because we both work with the Steelers and they know Heinz and, and me very well. And I told Heinz, I said, Heinz, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> and he looked at me and he, he, he knew I was spotting him about 30 years. So if I did, and everybody at the Steelers was kidding with him, you can't let Maroon beat you. <laughs> well, he didn't. So he did, he did win. He, got, he, he did very well, actually, uh, for his first race. He's an incredible athlete. And this is coming out of the swim. Oops. Coming out of the swim, crossing the finish line in 16 hours. You have to finish under 17, uh, or you're, you, you don't finish, and you're taken off the track. So... That's, that's a quick overview of it. So the next question, you know, what makes somebody do this? Why does a fairly busy neurosurgeon do such a challenging, and it is a challenge, uh, a challenging endeavor? Well, let me go back just a little bit in history uh, and explain the motivation. And, and when you talk to people who do this race, everyone has their own their own reason for participating in, in such an event. And uh, let me go back to ancient history before Harvey Cushing. When I was appointed chief of neurosurgery at Presby, Steelers consultant, traveling internationally, giving talks, waving the banner with Pete Janetta and others here, uh, doing all sorts of 
laser introduction, refining stroke uh, techniques, and doing leading miracle surgery. We actually, in this case, we exsanguinated completely the blood of an individual, hypothermia, uh, removed a giant aneurysm in the anterior communicating artery, and, and the patient survived. And uh, it was kind of a unique, it was a unique thing at the time. So here I am, here at Presby, on top of the world, doing everything that I wanted to do in my life, devoting my entire life to neurosurgery. And then adversity struck. What kind of adversity? Well, my father died suddenly of a heart attack. That same week, my wife left. Actually, it was about this time of year. It was terrible snow, uh, freezing weather uh, with our two kids. And I no longer could do neurosurgery. I quit. I was in the operating room. And as you know, when you get into trouble in the OR, all of us have a certain reserve. You know no matter how tough it is, you have to stick with it. I lost that. I was doing an aneurysm on a patient, and I, I got into some bleeding, and I had no reserve. Somebody helped me. We finished the case. I walked out of the operating room. And that was the last time I entered for a year. So what did I do? Well, my father was a, a businessman down in Wheeling, West Virginia. And uh, my mother was helping him with the business. So I left Presby. I walked out, and I didn't return. And uh, he, was, he, uh, he ran a truck stop. So one day, I was doing miracle surgery. The next day. I was at Dallas Pike Truck Stop in Dallas, West, Dallas Pike, West Virginia, filling up 18 wheelers, making hamburgers, and trying to survive. And I was living on a farm. I developed hepatitis. My immune system, the mind-body connection, was completely blown away. I had very bad hepatitis, literally almost died. and. Uh, wondered what I was going to do. This was clearly major adversity, clearly a crisis in my life. And what do you do when you're faced with a crisis? You turn right, you turn left. How do you get over the wall? What do you do? I was pathologically depressed. Uh, I could barely function. And uh, you, can, you consider all sorts of terminal, terminal events in these situations, bitter cold, uh, and after about three or four months in Wheeling, uh, a local banker that I knew who held the mortgage to all the properties of uh, my father that we owed money to called me and said, Joe, let's go for a run. I said, go for a run? I said, you know, I'm 20 pounds overweight. I haven't done anything except work in neurosurgery for many years. Uh, I had, I, I got short of breath this week walking up a flight of steps. And he said, go for a run. He said, come on, you have to. It might make you feel better. So this is the Tridelphia High School track down in Wheeling, West Virginia. And we went down, and uh, I made it four times around the track, I think, in about 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes maybe. We talked, jogged, walked. He kept encouraging me. And uh, I was totally exhausted after a mile. But I went home that night. I went to the farm where I was living alone. And for the first night in four months, I slept. I got some sleep. And the next day, I went back to that track myself. And I went around six times. And the next time, eight times. And then and I, kept, I kept increasing it. And eventually, I was sleeping better. And I realized I better change my diet. And I was eating truck stop food, garbage, anything you can, everything bad you can imagine. My body told me I better change if I'm going to survive this. So I started eating the right kind of diet, getting rid of the junk and the garbage. And uh, about this time, this was in the, uh, in the 80s, I heard about triathlon. My legs were getting sore. Joints were, were bothering me from too much running. I was the Forrest Gump of Wheeling, West Virginia. They'd say, there he goes. And uh, 
So I started to cross train. I read about triathlons and I said, well, maybe I should cross train. So I got on my bike that I hadn't ridden since the eighth grade. And uh, then I learned to swim. And uh, so I started to train. And these are smaller training races that I did with no thought in my life ever of doing a Hawaiian Ironman distance race. And uh, this is one in Florida, a Bud Light race in 1988-89. This was the uh, first half Ironman that I did in Muncie, Indiana, and uh, ended up in the medical tent. But I was, I, I was very proud of what I accomplished. And then in 1993, I uh, competed and uh, was able to finish the first Hawaiian Ironman championship in 1993 in 13 hours. So from 13 hours to 16 hours, I've lost an hour a decade. So <laughs> I guess next year or the next, I, I'm just going to make it maybe. But um, so that's, that's what triathlon's about, my motivation and how I got into it. Now, subsequently, I, I was very fortunate. I've competed in New Zealand, Canada, Europe, and five times in the Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiian Ironman, uh, which I think is a record for neurosurgery. I'm not sure. Uh, but so what? What have you learned from doing something like this? What do you learn from pushing yourself to your limits you know, it's said that you never know what your limits are until you try to exceed them. And uh, so what, what are some of the things I've learned that I can pass on to the residents in particular? And the first lesson is nothing comes easy. You've got to work, work hard for what you do. Uh, for this past distance race, uh, I tallied up my, my diary that I kept, and I biked 5,000 miles, ran 700, and swam 119 miles over the summer. So when I missed a few conferences this past summer, Robert, I, I, was, I was occupied. <laughs> I, was, I was very busy. Uh, I, the, the cathedral steps are great for training. Uh, if you have nothing to do at lunch hour and you, you can jog up and down the cathedral, take the elevator down, uh, it's a good way to... And the compu trainer, if you're a serious cyclist, you can't ride outside all the time in Pittsburgh. You need some help. And this is a... I, I did the Hawaiian Ironman race on my bike in my bedroom uh, five times, actually, before going to Hawaii this year. So you, you're all familiar with... Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Outliers, maybe. But in The Outliers, he had a very profound uh, statement in which he said that it takes 10,000 hours of practice in about 10 years, which means seven or eight years of residency and two years of practice before you take your boards to become competent in anything and to be, to be very good in anything. So that the time that it takes is all cumulative, but it takes this much time to be the best that you want to be in your profession or anything like it. So how do you get there? You do it just like you do every day, one operation at a time, one conference at a time, and, uh, uh, and, and, and work hard with your colleagues. So, so it's not easy. We know that. The other thing, it's the journey, not the finish. For your residency, for me, for everything we do, it's the journey, not the finish. This is a poem that, that I have that I'll hand out in back entitled The Station. Uh, David Kelly, who was one of the presidents of the CNS quite a few years ago, carried this around with him in his wallet. And he gave it to me, I don't know, 15 years or so ago. but. Basically, it's the last paragraph. Sooner or later, we realize there is no station, no place to arrive at once and for all. The true joy in life in the, is the trip. The station is only a dream. It constantly outdistances us. Today is the day the Lord hath made. We must rejoice and be glad in it. So that uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, its satisfaction lies in the effort, 
not in the attainment. Full effort is full victory. So that every day when you're making rounds, when you're scrubbing in the OR, when you're preparing for a talk or preparing for a lecture, really, really enjoy the moment. And there's nothing like, uh, in training for this, it's an incredible escape. Uh, biking along the most, some of the most beautiful rides I've taken, the California coast and even in the back hills around uh, Pittsburgh, up into Ohio, the Amish country, uh, running through the woods. Uh, this is a picture taken when I was training, uh, warming up before the Ironman. This is a church spire that uh, you see in the cove as, you, as the, the cannon sounds and you begin to swim. And uh, so it's the same thing in neurosurgery. You know, why do we continue to do what we do in a repetitive manner? Because when you look, when you look at the vascular anatomy, and, and doctor, the talk you gave was so important in terms of, in beautiful pictures, but the techniques that you emphasize, I'm going to touch on in just a minute. Uh, but when you look at the neuroanatomy of what we're blessed to be able to do on a daily basis, uh, it truly is incredibly exciting. Uh, one of the residents, who is this? Yasser. Anybody? Yasser. Yasser Gill. Who was Yasser Gill? Father of uh, modern microneurosurgery. Exactly. And he was, he was considered, the, the, the Journal of Neurosurgery had a cover article of him, neurosurgeon of the century. Um, and in terms of his contribution to vascular anatomy, tumors, uh, bypasses that were elegantly demonstrated by you. It all started, uh, as you know, with Dr. Yassergill. Another thing that I, I, lean, I, I learned from, from all of this is you have to lean on your friends. There's so many people, Jeff Boast, my support staff, Karen, all my nurses, and Matt, uh, the people that supported me throughout this whole program. You can't do it by yourself. You need help. And you shouldn't be ashamed or disappointed to be able to lean on your friends. And this is what the marathon looks like in Kona. You literally leave the city, go out into the lava fields. And by the time I'm finishing and getting to the marathon, it's 7, 8, 9 o'clock. And uh, it's a 140.2 mile race. And uh, I got to 130 miles three years ago and quit. I was dehydrated. I couldn't move. I had hyponatremia. I, I was delirious. I'm, what am I doing here? I've done this. What am I trying to prove? I've done this before. And, and I'm walking, just barely shuffling, waiting for the ambulance to come to take me back to the medical tent. And it's pitch black. And I hear behind me, click, 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 getting closer. And I think, what in the world is this? There can't be a horse out here. Click, click. And then a hand reaches out and touches me on the shoulder. I said, you can't quit. Come on, you can't quit now. I says, what are you talking about? I'm dead. Come on, follow me. Follow me. How? And I, I think, you know, this. what is this? And... Uh, so I, the click, click now goes, the Doppler effect goes in front of me. And a sh car comes down the, the road, just like this, except it's pitch black, and shines its light on this individual. And it glances off of his carbon fiber legs and his cheetah scoops. He's a double amputee, and also a triple amputee, and also no arm. You know, and I, I saw him, and... Uh, Somehow, I, I reached down and I finished the 10 miles and crossed the finish line. The next day, I'm having breakfast and I walk into a restaurant and I, I had no idea who this was. And I meet him at breakfast. I says, you don't know who I am, but you got me through this race. Subsequently, we became close friends. His name is Rajesh Durbal. Uh, this is what he looks like. 
And his story, we don't have time for, but it's a phenomenal story. He was born with deformed legs, as you can see. They were amputated. Uh, his lower legs were amputated. His arm is also uh, malformed. And he was the first triple amputee to complete the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon ever. That was three years ago. And it's a spiritual experience in that he was, as a kid, as you can imagine, ridiculed, chastised, made fun of. He was suicidal. He was wanting to end it all. And at the age of 25, he went into a church in New York, Long Island. And the, the minister said, all those who, whose burdens are too heavy, who can't handle what their life is all about, please come forward. And he said it was like a levitation act. He got up, walked forward, and literally was born again. And uh, to prove to God that he was really sincere, he challenged himself with a triathlon, a small triathlon. He made the, his own legs to fit into the bicycle. He learned to swim and, uh, and also got the scoop subsequently to run. And the other thing about friendship is that you never know where it's going to take you when you lean on your friends. You never, ever know how Juan, when you met down in the lab at uh, Dr. Roten's office, that you both would be sitting here together listening to an erudite lecture. Okay? You, knew, you had no idea. Well, I had no idea when I met Rajesh that <laughs> I would be climbing Mount Kilimanjaro next month. Rajesh called me two months ago and said, Joe, I've organized a trek of 10 athletes who are all amputees to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in February. And we'd very much like you to go as the team doctor. I said, well, I've not done much mountain climbing before Rajesh, but uh, he importuned me. So uh, I've been doing what I can to train for this. But again, from Kona to Kilimanjaro, I had no idea when I received this tap on the shoulder where that would take me in my own life. And it's the same with all of you here. The camaraderie that you build up, the friendship, the spirit, you have no idea where that's going to take you in the future. But one thing I can say, in the residence applicants that I've interviewed who have come through here, the most unanimous thing that I heard from all of them was the incredible camaraderie and fellowship amongst the residents in this program. So I think you've all learned that lesson. And the final lesson is don't quit. Never, ever quit. Uh, just like Rajesh helped me not to quit, this is Julie Moss in 1982 who got to within 100 yards of the race, dehydrated. She got up, collapsed, actually became incontinent. And, uh, but she couldn't be helped. No one can help you at the completion of the race. And she literally stumbled and then fell and then literally crawled across the finish line. As you can see her there crawling the last 10 yards <laughs> to finish. Um, this movie, this segment, is what really, this was shown around the world. And for some reason, it, it was a challenge to every athlete who wanted to extend themselves to the most. And this is what really kicked off the Ironman triathlon in terms of not quitting. Every day in the OR, we're challenged with some of the most incredible tasks in the middle of people's brains, their spinal cords, their, uh, their bodies. 
And who in here didn't get to the point at some point in, every, in, in a patient and say, I wish I weren't here. I wish somebody would come in and do this for me. I wish I could get out of this. How did I, why did I make the decision to operate on this patient? But you can't. You can't quit. You have to stick in there. And this is another poem that I have that I'll hand out to you. I have copies of. But basically, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, you can't quit. And, and it, it's something that uh, has gotten me through a lot of hard times. Finally, be humble in victory and gracious in defeat. With the Steelers, I've heard Coach Tomlin say this many, many times. At the end of the game, the players all take a knee. And if there's a big victory, he says, be humble in victory, guys. And if it's a defeat, be gracious in defeat. It's so important in neurosurgery the same way. What do I mean by that? This is a MRI of a man with, from India uh, with a pituitary tumor. Acromegaly, growth hormone secreting tumor. And this is he on the operating room table. And Paul and Carl and I uh, spent many hours saving his pituitary gland, enucleating the tumor from the stalk and from the gland itself, and eventually uh, really saving the guy. To get some idea of his size, <laughs> this is the Great Khalil. The Great Khalil is from Punjab, India, and is a star wrestler for the WWE. You've heard of Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant had the same disease, was a world famous wrestler, and died at age 47 of acromegaly and cardiac hypertrophy. Uh, we saved the great Khalil's life in that regard. And it's very tempting to say what a great surgeon surgeons we are. Not many people could have done this operation quite the way that it was done. But I learned very early in my career that you must beware of the Icarian phenomena of Icarus. Who is Icarus? Somebody? Icarus was the mythological son of Daedalus who was one of the greatest architects in the ancient world, who was imprisoned in a labyrinthine prison with a man-eating minotaur for some transgressions that they did to King Minos on the island of Crete. And Daedalus, being an engineer, constructed wings out of feathers and wax for, he, for him and his son so that they could fly out of this labyrinth in prison, and they did. But before flying, Daedalus cautioned his son. He said, my son Icarus, be careful not to fly too high, lest the sun melt the wax of your wings and you plummet into the sea. Nor fly too low, lest the water of the waves wet your wings and pull you down and you'll drown. In other words, this is the first mythological story of hitting, as Aristotle said, the mean between two extremes, of seeking balance in your life, of being humble in victory and gracious in defeat. And what do I mean by that? You know, every, well, in the next 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to have a complications conference, and we're going to discuss errors of judgment, like this. This is a patient with a hemangioma of the orbit that I operated on early on and blinded because we entered into the globe and removed some of the vitreous. We're going to talk about errors in judgment and technique. 
This is an angiogram of a patient with a, a, a large aneurysm that we operated upon, clipped the thinking, the aneurysm. The patient never woke up, died, three kids. And we thought we had done such a great job when we walked out of the operating room. Felt so good. You know, you flip off your gloves into the basket and you feel like, God, I, the patient was lucky to have me as a surgeon. We clipped the internal carotid artery aneurysm, a massive stroke, and she died. Error in technique, intramedullary spinal cord tumor, should have been a straightforward problem, too aggressive, and the patient's quadriplegic. Error in technique, every day this is a possibility in the operating room. MRI, spinal stenosis, too aggressive, tear the dura, the roots come out, wrap around the drill, and the patient is paralyzed and has no bowel or bladder function. Trying to play God, trying to do things that really are not in the best interest of the patient, but we think, well, let's try it. Let's give it a shot. So in summary, what I've learned is adversity introduces a man to himself. When you're pummeled, when you're kicked, when you're beaten, when, all, when the debts are low and the, 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 friends are, the friends are low and the debts are high, uh, remember that you're not sure what's good luck and bad luck in this world. And I have this copied for you as well. The things that, th this is a very good story. It's the story of an old farmer who had an old horse for tilling his fields. One day the horse escaped into the hills and the farmer's neighbor sympathized, the old man, and he said, bad luck, good luck, who knows? Later, the horse returned with a herd of wild horses from the hills. This time, the neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good luck. Good luck, bad luck, who knows, he said. Then, when the farmer's son attempted to tame the horse, fell off, broke his leg, what bad luck, horrible luck. The army came by, saw he had a broken leg, and didn't constrict him. So as he said, so we are wise when we leave it to God to decide what is good luck and what bad, and thank him that all things turn out for good. The point I want to make is that adversity, some of the worst adversities in our lives, oftentimes turns out to be the best lessons we've ever learned. Theodore Roosevelt has so many great sayings. He said that uh, the highest form of success comes not to the man who desires easy peace, but the man who does not shrink from danger, from hardship, or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. Have any of you read this? Did you read the New York Times this weekend? Who is this fellow? He's the chief resident at Stanford. Did, did you see this, Robert? He's a chief resident at Stanford, and in how long have I got left? And if you read the first paragraph, you'll see why he wrote it. I reviewed hundreds of scans for fellow doctors, but this scan was different. It was my own. He developed a cancer, and uh, he, he wrote of his own experiences with patients, what went through his own mind when he was given the ultimate diagnosis. And we would tell you if we could, which is our response to our patients, oftentimes on a daily basis. So summing it all up, what's the final message? I would say this, seize the day. Seize the day, guys and, and girls, because you never know when anything's going to happen. Make the most, and like William Osler, John Moosey's not here, is he? John, uh, William Osler, one of our, our favorite writers from Johns Hopkins uh, back in the early 20s. He said, live life in day daytime compartments so that you really make the most of every day, of every lesson, of every learning experience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for letting me share this with you.
thank you. Uh, this was a classic. And I know that this is one thing that uh, everybody in this room is really going to remember uh, this talk for all the teachings and for all the right reasons. Uh, uh, so many of the things that you do are an inspiration to many of us and many in neurosurgery that, uh, you. that know you and remember you uh, fondly. And you know, before I came to Pittsburgh, I knew of you. And all the things that people said I didn't think were real. How could a person do all those things? But uh, really, it's it's a, it's a, it's an honor to have you um, among us. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it.